I grew up in Minnesota, in the suburbs of Minneapolis. Before moving to Boston five years ago, I lived in the uptown neighborhood of Minneapolis, less than five miles away from where George Floyd was murdered. In August, I traveled back to Minnesota with my partner to visit family, and I had the opportunity to see the memorial that's been built for George Floyd by the community at the location he was killed. It was breathtaking and filled with so many artifacts of grief, resistance, and hope. I left feeling as though I had stumbled upon a space that was both sacred and untouchable. I had this experience after spending an afternoon with my sister walking up and down the streets of Uptown. We were taking pictures of all the street art we could find painted on the walls, doors, and windows of businesses during the protests that followed Floyd's death. Almost everywhere we looked, we found a mural painted on every available surface, and much of this art persisted even months later. But there are also places of decay, places where art had been covered up or removed and put in the trash. The face of this neighborhood had been painted over by protests demanding change, but that paint would soon be washed away by another force, the force of gentrification. If there's anything constant about the narrative of Uptown, it's that this part of the city is no stranger to change. Uptown is a part of the city that I know and love, but when I returned in August after being away for a couple of years, I was reminded that the city continues to remake itself. But this time, it felt like something seismic was occurring beneath the surface. Although gentrification has dramatically transformed the neighborhood, the voices displaced by that transformation have reclaimed the neighborhood from themselves in astonishing ways. For example, in this part of the city, there is a lake. And this lake is the defining landmark of my own emotional connection to the city. Up until I moved to Boston, that lake was named Lake Calhoun. But in 2018, it was renamed to Bidet Makaska to honor the Dakota land it's located on and to reject the original name's connection to slavery. Walking around the lake again in August, I could sense that this body of water that had grounded my own experience living in the city now existed in the public imagination in a way that felt different from what I remember in 2015. All around the lake, art installations have popped up to honor the area's Dakota heritage. And it felt like a different place, although at the time I couldn't articulate exactly why it felt different. Away from the lake, all of the art that covers the buildings continues a similar theme, an appeal to be seen and heard. But while the new name of the lake is here to stay, the art that's painted up, down, up and down the streets will disappear with gentrification. And it's for this reason I felt compelled to document as much of what is still there as possible to ensure that these expressions of trauma and resistance can be preserved before being displaced by the flow of time. My compulsion to document this art didn't start with the art itself. It started with a kernel of something else that's deeply embedded in who I am and the work that I do. And that is a sense of responsibility I feel to use my creative practice of data visualization for the act of witnessing. I am a designer of data, and my practice mandates that I steward my capacity to see in a way that renders visible that which is kept invisible. Documenting this art, I wanted to use visualization to show how the resistance embedded within it was constellated over space and time and to reject the narrative of change that would soon erase it all from history. And I wanted to use my work in design, the window through which I understand the world, to declare that I see and bear witness to the trauma that has been racialized and rendered invisible in Minneapolis and beyond. This process of documentation was a reminder that as human beings, we have been endowed with unprecedented control over the act of seeing. This is one of our greatest affordances of our modern existence, but it's also one of our greatest privileges. Our technologies have re-engineered what it means to encounter the world and document those encounters to share with other people. And with this, there are now many different ways we can use our eyes. We can look, we can view, we can watch, we can monitor, either synchronously in real time and space or asynchronously through our technologies of convenience. Through these modes, we consume the world in greater detail than ever before, offering us access to new levels of experience we previously never knew existed. 
But even though we can now consume the world with our eyes in more ways than ever before, I can't help but feel we've become comfortable with those forms of seeing that require the least of our attention. And this, I think, is a key part of that thing I couldn't articulate when I was in Uptown, that something had changed. The reclaiming of Dakota heritage and the art affirming that Black Lives Matter, they weren't passive statements. They were desperate pleas to be seen and heard through a window that in recent times has framed the narrative of the community purely as a story of gentrification. They were reconfigurations of the civic imagination of this neighborhood, thrusting those who have been kept invisible into the public consciousness by appealing to the eyes. It's in this recognition that my practice comes in. I visualize data, and through visualization, I study the windows that shape how we see the world. And through my work, I've come to notice that we seem to be less and less aware of the many different ways we see with more than just a pointing of the eyes. For example, listening is a form of seeing, but with the ears instead of the eyes. We can re read and interpret a text, like a passage of a novel or a poem, and we can notice and observe subtle shifts in body language. We can choose to see through physicality, such as when we embrace someone we love, or through empathy, like when we offer our condolences for someone's passing. Each of these acts is a different window through which we see. And through these windows, we are privileged with the ability to calibrate the scope of our attention, how far we see and for how long. These different ways of encountering the world come with the burden and responsibility. It's no longer sufficient to just see because sometimes we see too much or we see things we don't expect or want to see. When this happens, we are challenged with the burden of not only controlling what we see, but also with the burden and responsibility of performing that seeing with care. And this gets tiring. When we get too tired, we take the same technologies that have enhanced our ability to see and redesign them again to enhance our ability to look away. When these features are built into the architecture of our technologies, we are given permission, and with it privilege, to choose what we want to see and when. My creative practice is predicated upon this privilege of seeing. It's also built upon the privilege of being able to choose what and when to not see. Through design, I'm called upon to question the ways we are both challenged and forgiven in our act of seeing while also recognizing the ways that I myself wield immense power over deciding what is made visible or invisible. Through visualization, I have to make choices about what data to visualize, how to analyze them, and how to express them through lines, points, and colors. In each of these choices is wrapped up in questions of seeing, because how a data set is designed partitions who and what gets seen and not seen and how I then visualize those data creates a window that exaggerates those partitions even further because I get to decide what gets expressed and who gets left out. Data visualization is a kind of technology of seeing. I want to use that technology and the privilege that comes with it to elevate ways of seeing that are intimate and generative. But in acknowledging my own responsibility towards seeing as a creator, I've also become even more aware of the responsibility we have as viewers towards the same act. As viewers, our relationship with seeing seems to bend more and more towards technologies that prefer the distant and the abstract. The most familiar of these are social media platforms. The control that they wield is amplified further by smartphones, these devices that give us the power of taking quality photos anytime and anywhere in the hands of more people than ever before. And with it, we begin to take seeing for granted. And we stop asking ourselves how our way of seeing has fundamentally changed as a result of these technologies. And when we start taking seeing for granted, there arises a dangerous disregard of collective responsibility. To use the simple act of seeing as a means of affirming the humanity of ourselves and other people. In this moment, we are heaving in crises of many kinds. 
One of these is a crisis in seeing. Many of our new ways of seeing are no longer reliable. Entire identities have been displaced throughout history as a result of explicitly not seeing, recognizing, or acknowledging. In the midst of this crisis, we are called upon to see in a more radical way, to witness, to attest, to look in the direction of what we've been given permission to look away from. And in this moment, we must arise as responsible witnesses and acknowledge that those of us who have been privileged the most by enhanced ability to see are responsible for the failures of visibility that have brought us to where we are now in this time. As witnesses, it is our responsibility to reclaim for ourselves the same technologies of seeing that have enabled us to look away. These are the windows through which we relate to the world. The simplest of these is available between our eyes, the technology of attention. This is also perhaps the most heavily designed technology in our human history. Other windows are formed by our upbringing or our relationships with other people. Some windows are learned professions like design or journalism or photography. Some windows are technologies like social media. Through visualization, I study these windows, who controls them, and how our way of understanding the world is animated within them. For example, I've used visualization to show how language has changed on federal websites around climate change, based on data collected by the Environmental Data and Governance Initiative. These data track where terms like climate change and greenhouse gases have been inserted and deleted on web pages over time. In this project, I used visualization to represent these changes as mutations in DNA, connecting those mutations to the federal government's mutating rhetoric around climate and the environment. In another project, I collaborated with the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project and New Law Lab at Northeastern to design an interactive map and timeline showing when and where African Americans have been killed by police in the southern United States using data from the Burnham Nobles archive. Like visualization, an archive is also a kind of technology of seeing, one that preserves and protects the visibility of people, events, and moments in history against the erosion of time. And also like visualization, creating an archive is wrapped up in questions of seeing too. The visualizations in this project are a translation from one mode of seeing to another. And they're designed to lift the stories of victims in the archive in a way that preserves them in public memory by pointing attention to them. In a more recent project, I'm using visualization to critique how news media compose our attention literally through design. In March and April, I collected screenshots of home pages of five news websites at 10 minute intervals. Then through data analysis, I compared each pair of screenshots in time side by side to figure out which parts of the pages stayed the same and which parts changed. I represented these changes through heat maps, showing which regions of pixels turned over with news stories most quickly throughout the day and weeks and across news outlets. The purpose of this project is to illustrate how our attention to the news has become designed through the same mechanisms we have for reading the news. The news is always available at our fingertips and it's one of the most influential windows we have for understanding the world. And yet we don't often notice just how much it's been designed specifically for our consumption. It is windows like these that we are challenged to reclaim in this moment. Through them, we render the world visible and invisible. We are challenged to recognize our own individual privilege of seeing and use that privilege to bear witness. To bear witness, we must be radical in how we see, and we must be radical in where we point our attention. Our windows may grow heavy and our arms tired, but we must continue to hold them up for those who cannot. This is the responsibility that comes with the privilege of seeing. To start, we can recognize that our privilege of seeing exists precisely because we have disenfranchised others of a basic human right to be made visible. This requires us to document in ways that are both ethical and radical. We need to stop ourselves from reconstructing timelines or claiming spaces in ways that displace other voices. 
We need to be precise in our language while also making room for the imprecision that comes from messy exp experience. We should strive toward listening more and speaking less, and we should try to elevate qualitative expression over quantitative representation. These require radical shifts in our relationship to the world, including my own work in visualization. I recognize there's not much that I can do individually to solve the problems of this time. But I do recognize that the most valuable thing I can contribute in this moment is my ability to see deeply. My window is my creative practice. And in this moment and beyond, I will continue to declare my commitment to steward that window and uphold the responsibility of bearing witness to this unfolding moment. And if each of us can commit to reclaiming our own windows, whatever they might be, perhaps that is the most radical form of seeing of all.